the big bit that's its clock that people can see go away in terms of submission. It's fascinating data. Okay, let's see if this will all work for us. It's not equipment that... Ah, look, we're in luck. My God, I'm back in the 70s. Well, the 80s, but yes. So uh, the video system here isn't really accustomed to this kind of computer, so we just need to uh, do a slight adjustment here. Let's see if I can get it right first time, right? should be far enough to the right. <laughs> Sorry, how come it's so fast? No, no, this is a 48 megahertz Commodore 64. So you're also witnessing a world record. Sorry? No, that's indeed. So let's uh, see if everything is going to work for me here. I've got the the right file here. So user interfaces have come a long way in the last uh, quite some time, right? Yeah. Don't Especially, see there we are. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Poor maligned creatures. I... Look at that. <laughs> We're in action. <laughs> And uh, to prove that this is all feasible, this was done an, in an hour earlier this morning. So, <laughs> uh, so I am Paul. And uh, what a, this whole interesting issue of understandable computers and whether computers now have become so incomprehensibly complex that it's not putting our students at a disadvantage to actually learn the basics that will then let them go on to understand the complexity we now have. So romanticised view of the 1980s. You know, computers were real computers in the 1980s. Programmers were real programmers, and small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri were real small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri. So, is, you know, is this all a romantic memory, or is there something to this uh, kind of perspective? And so it seems to me, and I don't have the evidence for this, and I would like to collect the evidence, that at least stereotypically, the programmers who came through in the 70s and 80s where the computing hardware was so simple um, that it was effectively naked and you had to understand, in fact, how the computer worked at a basic way. You had to know how a CPU did its thing. You need to know what memory was and that this provided an effective scaffolding uh, that has helped modern students. And as a result, they behave very causatively with the computers, but students now in the 21st century, again, quite stereotypically here, uh, interact in a much more symptomatic way. It's kind of, oh, it doesn't work, I'll reboot it, I'll you know, roll the dice again in my code and hit resubmit, and, and hopefully it'll work. They're not able to reason in that deep way. And it's this whole question of to what extent is that because of the, the kinds of computers that we have them uh, working on. So, and I've kind of said half of now what I'm going through here. So the computers now are terribly complicated. And so real computers aren't real computers anymore. And so therefore, perhaps the programmers we're turning out, because of the way we're teaching them and what we, the complexity they're faced with from day one, they don't get to be what we might, again, romantically like to call a real programmer, uh, you know, who can do uh, crazy but probably useless things uh, with there. So here is the question that I really want to try and explore and I, I hope to explore over the next uh, year or two if I get the opportunity, is you know, can we recreate that deep understanding? Is, it, is there some kind of sensible new old computer system that is not a toy like, I mean, I'm frequently like the, the NAND to Tetris, I really love because you start simple and they can get this kind of appreciation but perhaps it, it and I think actually part of the student engagement comes from Tetris is something they know. There is this cultural touch point with it. Um, and so the computers of the 1980s have even more of that cultural touch point to get people interested. They can look at the old games, they can try them out and kind of get into the, the mode of, and mood of it and get that emotional engagement that hopefully will let them prosper and, you know, and desire to learn how to, uh, uh, to do these things. So how would we do this? And I think you know, these are just 
initial kind of thoughts that I have around this, and I welcome other people's input and suggestions as to how we might do it better, but um, you know, there should be no IDE. The IDE is an abstraction between the programmer and the programmed, and we want to remove that as much as we can. Um, oh, look, and I didn't delete one of the lines of uh, basic when I was writing the slides. Um, but, you know, we can fix it, right? Uh, where's the extra line? 120, right? Slide fixed. You know, this is the kind of simple nakedness uh, that I think has some value. And so, to me anyway, and it's showing biases of how I grew up with computers and which particular ones, I think, you know, basic and 8-bit assembly and sort of the, the raw uh, computer is a, a nice way uh, that we can look at that. And so at the end of the day, the goal is no more magic. I don't want the students to be symptomatically interacting with the computer in any way. If they can causatively do what they need to do, then I think that's a tremendous gift that we can give them, so long as, and this is the challenge, that that knowledge is transferable to more modern systems. And so there may need to be a, a tension and a dynamic in the teaching to say, okay, let's look at how this was done in the 1980s and whether you kind of travel through time to catch up to the complexity of today or whether you just contrast with appropriate uh, pieces uh, is an interesting question in that. Uh, and again, I'm keen to hear uh, people's perspectives on how we might uh, try to do that. Um, so, you know, let's, you know, we have just a few minutes, but let's you know, try and do something with this. Um, you know, so let's have a look at how memory works. Um, so let's, oops, how many, exit to basic. That took a long time. Um, so we have, it's excellent because you're not a, a, a computer scientist by trade, right? <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but so did you know that computers have memory? I didn't know that much. Excellent. So do you have a, a clear idea about how memory works? Oh, God, no, no, okay, so, so, so let's go through it. So memory is all these cells that can each hold a value, right? So on this computer, each, each cell can hold a number between 0 and 255. So in a sense, it's that simple. And some bits of memory do special things. So on this ancient computer, Memory numbers 1024 to 2023 actually tell the video controller which character to draw on the screen. So it starts at the top left corner and moves across. So then we have this wonderful command called poke that will let us put something into a piece of memory. So we can say poke 1024. So I'm telling you that's the first byte uh, of the, uh, the screen. Um, what's your favourite letter? L. So that's the twelfth letter. So in theory, if I get this right, if we put the number twelve, that will actually should put an L in that top left corner of the screen. Because it's that simple. Um, and if we want to find out what's in a piece of memory, we can ask the computer with peak. So if we ask it what's in the thousand twenty four, what 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 should we find in the thousand twenty four? Magic alert. Sorry? Excellent. Because you've got a question mark and you've got extra parentheses. How does that differ from the abstraction of an idea? Ah, excellent. You're right. And I'll, the answer I'll give to that is I can go through that abstraction in about two minutes and you'll probably be able to remember it. But... Sorry, say again? Ah, see, so you know, it's leading to really good questions. So now we can talk about character set layouts and we start addressing a whole pile of these core concepts um, that come up on all real computers in a fairly rapid kind of way. And so we can kind of, we can do a depth first search down through all of these questions and come back up again before Christmas, is my hope, yes. Which high level programming language are you giving up for this? There's a really good question. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to, we are no, no, no. looking right now about yep. whether we should be introducing ideas. Yes. Because we teach, our, we teach off on the command line. Yep. Mm. Um, because of the things we could get if students are not making silly mistakes in yep. code that can be picked up by spell check. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we switch to C as a programming language yep. to give students the, the, the memory model. Yes, exactly indeed. What yep. about. But it's such a struggle mm. because the days of 
causative low abstractions yep. of a virtual memory system are gone. In, indeed, and so we have to make them again. So you know, we have, you know, an FPGA board is doing the hard work of giving us VGA output on an 8-bit machine. So yeah, and so uh, for me, this is, you know, in an ideal world, where we didn't have to worry about all the other pressures that are on how we teach. This might be a four to six week beginning, so that you crash them into what is a computer, understand the core of it. And then you say, okay, now you got really annoyed at how hard it was to do X, Y, and Z. And once you've got them to that point of frustration, it's time to move on. I yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I indeed. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Have you thought about what you mean for the computer systems course rather than on the programming side? The programmatic is they're going to do optimizing compilers yeah. and things that run better for assembly and machine code. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what we're with the NAFTA technical things we can talk mm. about, Yeah. And if you've got that, the stuff you do in programming fits neatly into that abstraction. Yes. Uh, I, I think I do not have an answer. I think mm. it's a magnificent question because it forces us to examine what's important. Yeah. And that's right. And I think and this, the question of learnability and the cognitive load, and of course the cognitive load that people will tolerate, is somewhat based on their engagement level with the material as well. And it is the kinematic mm. load figures in this too. Students yep. who try to type. I mean, Java is terrible for this. Sometimes you get capitals matter. So the yep. system with a capital S, not the same system with a lowercase s, and it increases frustration. So mm. they're trying to think about something. They're novices, so they don't have a composite pattern. Yep. So everything's taking separate spots. Then you add kinematic load. So IDEs in that role, yeah. people, we're thinking about have a definite place. But you're right, they abstract. Yeah. We don't have, if I punch the system here, there are a whole lot of mechanisms that eventually move something into place down there. Correct, that's right. And, and, and that's the magic we're trying to avoid. And some of it comes from my, and I'll admit that it's a very um, second-hand and symptomatic observation of students coming through that you know, we're getting students coming through into second semester of second year and they haven't got that understanding of memory structure and how the computers work. Which programming language do you use in first year? Uh, so historically for a while it's been Java and I don't think that's been particularly helpful in that regard. We had issues with Java. People yeah. got good at the object model and they had no idea how memory references were. That's the reason. Yeah. I mean, we actually went to C++. Mm. Which we've done as well for, I think it's the same reason. Yeah. Um, so I guess so the last thing I'll, I'll sort of say before we uh, finish up here with this, I think one of the pieces of value is that it becomes feasible without a huge amount of time to, you can show the students some of the games from the early 80s because there is a huge software library for this platform and you can basically say, okay, try and make something like that. And the barrier is so low for them to be able to make tangible progress on a daily basis with that, that you know, winning their interest uh, and desire, I think, is something that, uh, I hope that we can do. I think there's also people doing this as a parallel activity. 
Yes, ab absolutely. In terms of the, being able to get some kind of cheap mode, running yeah. a virtual system on an existing computer, doing it as a part distance or you know, part pre-recorded package, people can explore this, and then they've got the project work that ties in with all the other things that are being taught. So in terms of how you could be using this, it doesn't necessarily have to take up space in the core. No, that, that's right, yeah. It can be out and mm. off to one side. And it's actually, the history of computing is something we should learn as yeah. computer scientists because it's important. And we're young enough that we can remember most of it. And it's just for the hobby person. I am. Yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. you. You are going to no presenter, aren't you? Uh, yes. Thank you. So, and the 12 is there, yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think there's a really interesting question to go into. Certainly, I think we get more people to the front door, but then the front door is now so complicated that for them to progress into proficiency in causative interaction with the computer instead of symptomatic, that it's now gone from this kind of you know gradual slope to now it's just brick, brick wall and you have to be able to climb 40 feet up glass. And I think my, my final statement as I hand over the microphone is actually to say that this approach I think you could take straight into primary schools. You don't have to wait till they come to university. You know, primary school kids were doing it in the 80s. They can do it today.